The fire department driver operator or engineer is responsible for getting equipment and personnel from the station to the emergency scene when the call is received. The ability to safely operate fire apparatus is crucial to your success as a driver operator and is critical to your department's overall public image. You must be able to maneuver the apparatus in all types of emergency and non-emergency situations and in all kinds of weather conditions. In this presentation on safe operation of emergency vehicles, we will present safety factors you need to know to operate fire apparatus. Our focus will be on pumping apparatus, but the safe driving information applies to all types of emergency vehicles. The training objectives are to present safe driving techniques that apply to all emergency vehicles, to show how to correctly start and operate both gasoline and diesel-powered pumping apparatus, and to demonstrate the performance criteria for the practical driving exercises in NFPA 1002. In order to make good driving decisions when responding to an emergency call, a driver operator should know the laws and rules that apply to emergency vehicles and should have hands-on training in the safe operation of the apparatus. You are responsible for all aspects of the operation of the vehicle. You need to make certain that the equipment is safe and in good condition. And you must require that everyone on the apparatus is seated and wearing a seat belt before the apparatus begins moving. You are also responsible for knowing and following all laws, ordinances, and policies that apply to driving in your jurisdiction. It not only reflects badly on the public image of the fire department when an apparatus is involved in an accident, but you may also be subject to personal, criminal, and civil prosecutions for actions resulting in an accident. Remember that if you are involved in an accident on the way to an emergency call, you have endangered not only the people at your accident scene, but also those people at the original emergency who are waiting for help. For these many reasons, it is critical that you maintain an attitude of safety first whenever you are behind the wheel. Five factors are cited as frequent causes of accidents involving emergency vehicles. They are improper backing of the apparatus, reckless driving by the general public, excessive speed of the emergency vehicle, lack of driving skill or experience by the apparatus driver, and poor apparatus design or maintenance. What's the purpose of the uh, braking? Some of these factors can be eliminated by your training or driving attitudes. Some cannot. The important thing is to minimize the probability of an accident by maximizing your control of the vehicle. A high percentage of collisions occur when backing the emergency vehicle. It is often necessary to back up at the emergency scene for a better position, when leaving the scene to return to the road, or when backing into the station. Although backing up accidents usually do not involve injury or death, they do account for significant amounts of damage claims to the apparatus. These damage costs are generally avoidable if you follow two simple rules. First, avoid backing up the apparatus whenever possible. It is safer to drive around and reposition the vehicle rather than back up. Second, use spotters whenever you need to back up. At least one firefighter, or preferably two, should clear the way and warn the driver operator of any potential problems. If you do not have anyone on scene who can act as a spotter for you, it is best to not back up the apparatus until someone shows up. To compensate for reckless driving by the general public, defensive driving skills are crucial. Be especially alert when crossing intersections. Use all warning devices and come to a complete stop at blind intersections or intersections where the apparatus has a stop sign or light. The driver operator must remember that other drivers on the road may not yield the right of way or may not hear the warning signals. It is possible to overdrive your siren by driving so fast that there is not enough time for the siren to be in the range of the other driver's hearing. 
Also, depending on your direction of approach, it may be impossible for other drivers who hear your siren to tell what direction you are heading. In these situations, it is important to keep in mind that arriving safely is more important than being right. The key to safe driving is anticipation. Look ahead and find a safe path and expect the unexpected. Sometimes the public panics when they see an emergency vehicle and they stop suddenly or swerve into your path of travel. In all situations, do all that you can to make sure that other drivers see and hear you. Excessive speed by an apparatus driver operator can result in two types of accidents. You lose control on a curve or bad road surface, or you cannot stop in time to avoid hitting another vehicle or object. Excessive speed is especially dangerous when you lack skill and experience in handling the apparatus. It is important to remember that because of additional weight, the fire apparatus you are driving will never be able to stop as fast as your own car or truck. For example, the stopping distance for a fire apparatus in weather conditions such as rain or ice will increase by 3 to 15 times. Also, fire apparatus are usually equipped with air brakes that take longer to activate than the hydraulic or mechanical brakes on a car. Fire apparatus collisions that are blamed on driver-operator error tend to be caused by overconfidence on the part of the driver, the inability of the driver to recognize danger, or a lack of understanding of the capabilities or controls of the apparatus. Actually driving the apparatus and seeing what it and you can and cannot do under various conditions and situations is crucial to becoming an experienced driver operator. Although you will have little control over apparatus design, you will have responsibility to maintain the apparatus in a safe condition. By following an effective preventive maintenance program, your department can minimize the hazard of accidents caused by equipment failure. One of the first steps in safe operation of fire apparatus is to follow proper startup procedures. For starting most pumping apparatus, the steps are disconnect all ground shore lines. This includes any electrical cords, air hoses, or exhaust system hoses. Some ground lines are designed to pop off automatically when the apparatus is started or moved. But always look to make sure that they do before driving out of the station. Next, find the vehicle battery switch. Most apparatus have two batteries. The switch may have four different settings. Off, battery one, battery two, and both. Some apparatus only have a simple on-off switch. You must operate the battery switch before you start the engine. Once you get into the cab, set the ignition switch in the on position. If your apparatus has a manual transmission, you should depress the clutch pedal and make sure the transmission is in neutral. Now, operate the starter control to turn over the engine. If your apparatus has an automatic transmission, make sure it is in park or neutral and then operate the starter control. When the engine is started, observe the gauge readings for oil pressure, ammeter, and other indicators that show whether the engine is operating properly. While the engine is idling, take a minute to adjust the seat, mirrors, and steering wheel. Diesel engines should only be driven when they are warm and many departments use engine heaters to keep the engine warm at all times. If your department does not have an engine heater, be sure to start the engine as soon as possible after receiving the alarm to allow for maximum warm-up time. If responding with an engine that has not yet reached the proper driving temperature, keep the RPMs moderate and use a lighter than normal throttle until the engine is warm. In all response situations, you should wait until the oil pressure gauge is at a normal reading before driving the apparatus. An engine without oil to lubricate it will not take you very far. It is critical that you check the gauges regularly while operating a diesel apparatus. 
If the oil pressure gauge flutters, the oil level may be low. Check the oil level when the engine is stopped. The air pressure, ammeter and temperature gauges should also be checked regularly. The key to driving diesel engines for maximum efficiency in engine life is easy does it. This may seem difficult to do when responding to an emergency, but you can achieve adequate power by maintaining RPM control through correct throttling. When you return to the station, always allow a hot engine to idle and cool down for three to five minutes. This cool down procedure will eliminate hot spots in the engine. Immediate shutdown can result in serious problems such as damage to heads and destruction of the turbocharger. Shut off the engine by turning off the ignition switch and then the battery switch. When you park in the station, reconnect the ground shore lines. To qualify as an emergency vehicle driver operator, you must demonstrate competency in both written tests and driving exercises. The driving exercises include tasks that simulate actual handling of the apparatus in fire ground operations. We will demonstrate five driving exercises presented in NFPA Standard 1002 for fire apparatus driver operator professional qualifications. The exercises are the alley dock, the station parking procedure drill, the serpentine course, the confined space turnaround, and the diminishing clearance exercise. The alley dock exercise tests your ability to back the vehicle into a tight space simulating an alley, a dock, or a fire station bay. First, you will drive forward past the alley course. Then put the vehicle into reverse. Now, you will make a left turn backing into the alley. Points are awarded for your ability to come as close as possible to the back of the alley without hitting a marker or making any other penalty. The station parking procedure drill measures your ability to back the apparatus into a fire station to park or to reverse direction and back it down a street. A marker placed on the ground indicates the proper position of the left front tire once the apparatus is stopped and parked. The serpentine course measures a driver's ability to maneuver the apparatus in close limits without stopping. The exercise requires you to negotiate the marked course in both forward and reverse gears. A spotter is used when driving in reverse. Here is a demonstration of driving the serpentine course in reverse gear. The confined space turnaround evaluates your ability to turn the vehicle around in a confined space without striking any obstacles. The turn is to be completed in an area 50 feet by 100 feet, or 15 and a quarter meters by 30 and a half meters. You need to drive into the opening at the center of one of the 50 foot legs, turn the vehicle 180 degrees, and then return through the opening. At no time should any portion of your vehicle extend over the boundary lines of the space. The diminishing clearance exercise measures a driver's ability to steer the apparatus in a straight line, to judge distances from wheel to object, and to stop at a finish line. This exercise also should be performed in both forward and reverse gears, with a spotter used for reverse. Let's watch as an experienced driver demonstrates the diminishing clearance exercise.
In this program, we have presented safe driving techniques that apply to all emergency vehicles, shown how to correctly start and operate both gasoline and diesel-powered fire apparatus, and demonstrated the performance criteria and driving exercises for pumping apparatus found in NFPA 1002. Your ability to safely and efficiently operate emergency vehicles makes you a valuable member of your fire department. The job requires learning about all aspects of the vehicles and taking time for regular hands-on training in the driver's seat. When you are responding to your first alarm as a driver operator and the traffic is heavy on a windy, wet day, you'll agree that this training was time well spent.